following interview was conducted with Martin C. Jeske, the 10th president of Purdue University, for the Purdue University Oral History Project. It took place on Friday, January the 26th, 2007, at his office in Hufti. Our uh, the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian, and also sitting in is Valerie Yazzo, one of our diversity fellows, uh, visiting professors. Welcome. Good afternoon, Dr. Jeske. First off, let's talk a little bit about the students. I remember on your first day on campus, one of the first things that you touched base with was the exponent, and you've continued your student contact since then. Some of the events you meet with the PSD every semester and the residence halls. And tell us a little bit about some of these meetings and uh, interactions and things that you well, I think students are pretty important. Uh, uh, it's uh, our most important responsibility, uh, educating students. And I've always enjoyed being with students. I love to teach and think I do it reasonably well. So uh, it's always been an important part of my uh, work. And uh, I, I I find it uh, both personally energizing and reminding that uh, never lose sight of the importance of uh, our work with students. So uh, I try to have a lot of contact with students. Uh, my wife Patty and I uh, have a president's leadership class in which students meet with us in our home uh, almost every Monday evening. Uh, it's a group of about 30 freshmen. and. We talk about uh, leadership and um, student life and uh, opportunities at the university. I also meet regularly with the representatives of the Purdue Student Government, PSG, uh, uh, and I try very hard to accept uh, uh, as many of the invitations as I get from students to either residence hall groups, uh, sorority, sororities, fraternities. Uh, Last night, Patty and I took a group of uh, uh, women from Hillenbrand to the women's basketball game where we trounced Northwestern. Uh, uh, so we have a lot of contact with students, uh, in part because we enjoy students, in part because we want the students to know that the president thinks they're very important and a very high priority for the university. And, and finally, as an example for others at the university, that. We want everybody, uh, faculty, staff, all of uh, us who work here at Purdue to uh, never lose sight of the central importance of students. Have you visited, are you a fact fellow and were you in... in I'm not, but Patty is. Oh, okay. You know. uh, so you've gone to the residence halls and that's... Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been in the residence halls a number of times. Uh, uh, I, I, we get invited to dinner or uh, to residence hall meetings where uh, we talk with students, you know. Right. One of the things, I'm a fact fellow over at Tarkington, and one of the things that we've always enjoyed is the floor judging for Halloween. I mean, huh. some of them are very... Oh, yeah, the students are amazingly creative. creative. For uh, less money, they, I wish I could do it for $50. They're very creative, and they bring an enormous amount of energy, and uh, they're just fun to be with, right. uh, frankly. It's part of what uh, keeps the university young and vital is these, uh, these young people. And uh, the students at Purdue, I think, are just uh, absolutely terrific. Uh, they're bright, they're hardworking, uh, they know they're here for a good reason, a purpose. Uh, they have an enormous uh, affection for pride in Purdue. They have a deep respect for their faculty, their teachers, and I would say that respect is in turn returned by the faculty and staff of Purdue. I think all of us who work here at Purdue uh, really like our students and think they're terrific. Right. The other, no, uh, with that science found in your Purdue Opportunity Awards, there's something new that you initiated when you were here. You know, and for our researchers, just share a little bit that they may be able to benefit by by using this. Uh, Purdue things. is a land-grant university, and uh, uh, historically land-grant universities have been places that have emphasized access and opportunity. Uh, uh, we're part of the effort to democratize American higher education, and for literally uh, now 130 eight years, Purdue has been a place that's attracted lots of talented young people, often of very modest circumstances, uh, and given them a chance at a world-class education that has been transformative for them. And we've been an important part of the development of the country, certainly the development of Indiana. And, and that idea of access and opportunity for talented students, many of whom don't come from very wealthy families or wealthy backgrounds is a deeply rooted value of our university. 
Um, and it's an area that we have tried to renew, reemphasize, uh, pay attention to, particularly in this new time where the more complex higher education system in Indiana and across the country have differentiated the roles of institutions. Purdue is a great research university, tends to attract uh, pretty high ability students. We now in Indiana have regional campuses, a community college. So the menu of places, the number of different kinds of institutions that students can avail themselves of to pursue higher education is much, much larger than it was back in 1869 when Purdue was founded. There was really only one other public university, Indiana University at Bloomington, and a few private schools. Now we have a much, much larger, more differentiated system. But we still want to remain true to that idea of access and opportunity. And we've done a number of things uh, to try to make that happen. We've certainly worked hard to expand financial aid for students so that no student uh, is denied the opportunity to come to Purdue simply because of finances. And second, we've mounted a number of programs, uh, two that you mentioned in particular, the Purdue Opportunity Awards program and the Science Bound program as efforts to reach out to uh, students who might otherwise not think about coming to Purdue uh, or who are underrepresented here at our university. In the case of the Purdue Opportunity Awards program, uh, this was conceived as a program across the state where we would identify students uh, who are extremely needy, very high financial need, and second have had uh, challenging young lives. Uh, they've lost parents, they've had serious illnesses, uh, tragedy in their lives, and frankly might not even think about coming to Purdue. And, and we try to find those students through their counselors, uh, through Purdue alumni, through community leaders, and offer them a full ride scholarship in their freshman year, financial aid in their sophomore year, so that they can get through those first two years uh, without much of their own resources, and then help them in the last two years complete that undergraduate degree. Uh, we get hundreds and hundreds of applicants. We have one award available in every county of Indiana, so there are 92 Purdue Opportunity Awards students in each class. Uh, uh, we've got our third class here right now, and next fall we'll bring the fourth class in, and it's been enormously rewarding. Uh, uh, some of these young people are really heroic. Uh, they're, they're quite uh, talented, but they have, uh, they've had to deal with some very, very difficult circumstances, things like the loss of parents, uh, abusive relationships, uh, uh, pretty extreme poverty, uh, a lot of first-generation college students who, who, whose families have never had this experience before. And what's quite clear is that this Opportunity Award has changed their lives. Uh, it's brought them to the university. It's uh, showed them the talent they have and the fact that they can succeed at a great university like Purdue, and they're uh, overwhelmingly grateful. It's also had another interesting uh, effect. A lot of our alumni, uh, including in particular people who have donated to the university to help finance this Opportunity Awards program, feel a special bond with these students. Uh, Purdue has a lot of alums who were themselves in similar circumstances many years ago. First generation college students come from pretty modest economic circumstances. Um, coming to a great university like Purdue was a, not only a great opportunity, but um, a bit intimidating. And I think a lot of our alums identify with these Opportunity Award winners. So they've been very generous. We've raised literally millions of dollars for the program. Do you have you had any feedback from the parents do you, uh, of the students that have been selected in this? Do they? Oh, the parents are enormously grateful. Uh, and they enjoy visiting the campus. They come. Up well, yes. Although I would tell you, many of them, uh, not unlike the students, are are a bit intimidated by the size and scale of Purdue, uh, the splendor of all of it. And uh, uh, but but what really comes through is the is the enormous gratitude and pride. They have gratitude to Purdue for providing this opportunity for their son or daughter and this enormous pride and hope uh, for the future of this youngster. Uh, th these kinds of opportunities are often transformational for a family. 
um, these first generation college students, I can identify with that. I'm such a first generation person myself. Uh, I think for, for these families, this is the beginning of a whole new era, uh, a next level, if you will, for the family. Uh, because all the evidence is if, if you can get one generation of a family college educated, it's almost a certainty that all the subsequent generations will be. So very powerful. A second program we've started is the Science Bound program uh, uh, in Indianapolis. It's a partnership with the Indianapolis Public Schools uh, to help us increase the number of youngsters from the IPS schools, the Indianapolis Public Schools, who come to Purdue to study areas like engineering, science, technology, math science education, and agriculture. Uh, one of the things that I noticed when I first came to Purdue is uh, we had relatively few students coming from the Indianapolis Public Schools. And because there's such a sizable minority population in Indianapolis, particularly in the public schools, it was one of the reasons we didn't have uh, nearly the representation of African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans in our student body. Uh, I happened to be at a Christmas party at the governor's uh, mansion uh, when Frank O'Bannon was governor, when one of our alums, uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful fellow named Bob Bowen and his wife Terry were there, and we were talking about uh, this challenge of getting more minority youngsters to come to uh, Purdue. I mean, it gets back to this land-grant mission and this idea of access and opportunity. And uh, I told Bob uh, that I had an idea for a program uh, called Science Bound that maybe we could talk about. And he and Terry came here to, uh, uh, to West Lafayette, and we had lunch in this very office. And I described to them this Science Bound program where we would identify youngsters at the end of the seventh grade, uh, who based on a recommendation from a teacher or a counselor, uh, had the potential of uh, being able to come to a university like Purdue. We would put them through a five-year program, eighth grade and the four years of high school, um, extracurricular activities, summer camps, uh, mentoring, uh, summer jobs, internships, uh, all designed to better prepare them for Purdue and to raise their aspirations to think about coming to Purdue. And the great incentive we would put in front of them is a full tuition scholarship. So if they participated in the Science Bound program for five years at a sufficiently high level, we typically expect them to participate in 75 percent of the activities over that five-year period, um, and they're admitted to one of these programs here at Purdue, they would get a full tuition scholarship. Um, we have now had five classes at Science Bound. There are roughly 300 students in it, and our first set of enrollees here at Purdue will be here next fall. Uh, and we have about 25 students coming, um, and it's been enormously rewarding. Uh, we've gotten terrific support from alumni and friends like the Bowens. They've been very generous and helping to fund the program, and from a number of corporations, not only in Indianapolis, uh, Duke Realty, uh, Eli Lilly Incorporated, and others, but also from some national corporations like General Electric. And so uh, uh, the program has worked very well. I have found it enormously satisfying. Uh, uh, you get to watch these uh, youngsters in the seventh grade. They're, they're excuse me, more like boys and girls, and by the time they get to be seniors in high school, they're young men and young women, and you, you watch them mature and grow, and in particular, uh, they develop their self-confidence, uh, they have a direction, a purpose. Uh, uh, in the first year of Science Bound, we had 60 students enrolled. Every student had better grades in the first year of Science Bound than they had in the previous year in the seventh grade. So it's clear that this program, which is designed to lift their aspirations, uh, part of the program is to help their parents better understand how these students need to get prepared, has a real impact on their academic performance. It has a real impact on their aspirations. Uh, we think we've had a big impact on these students. And in addition to all of that, 
It's been a wonderful partnership for Purdue and the IPS schools. I think our university has a much better appreciation for the challenges of these large urban school districts. I think the people at IPS value this partnership with this great research university here in West Lafayette. It's been uh, tremendously satisfying uh, from quite a number of uh, perspectives. It, but another example of how we are trying to live out our land-grant heritage in this new time. When Purdue was founded in 1869, Indiana was basically a rural state, and uh, there weren't big urban cities like we have in Indianapolis today, and it was a very different population. Um, uh, we're trying to adapt uh, in an appropriate and meaningful way to today's circumstances and uh, creating opportunities for needy kids all over the state through the Opportunity Awards program and uh, urban youngsters through, in this case, the Science Bound program. Very good. That's nice. It'll be interesting to see the first class count still after B round. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. This is, of course, probably where you, we talk about affordability, and that's one of the things we try to keep. Education keeps increasing, and we try to keep. We try to keep it as affordable as possible, watching the tuition and things of that sort. It's a challenge. It is. Um, I like so many other factors in today's economy. There are several factors at work in uh, at work in why tuition increases. First, the obvious inflation. Uh, prices go up, uh, and we have to keep up with that. Uh, second, uh, though, uh, one of the things we have had to live with in the time I've been president of Purdue is a rather difficult fiscal environment in Indiana, uh, and uh, it's been a difficult time for the state in financing higher education. In the six years, six and a half years I've been at Purdue, our state budget has just not grown at all. It started out at about $270 million in 2000, and then dropped. And we've barely gotten back up to that 270 now, seven years later. Uh, so over seven years, state funding hasn't changed. And we've had to absorb all of the inflationary increases, and it's largely fallen on the tuition of students, uh, paid by students and their families. In addition to inflation and state funding, there's also a third factor involved here, and that is we've tried to make Purdue a better institution. Um, uh, as uh, we have talked before, um, our, uh, our goal is to take Purdue to that next level, uh, uh, to make it an even better institution, to improve the success of our students, to enrich the education of our students, to grow our research program. And so to do that, to make Purdue better, in part takes resources. So that's a third driver, inflation, state funding, and our aspirations for higher quality all have been factors uh, in making tuition uh, go up. We've tried to deal with the impact of this on needy students by increasing financial aid. And we have more than doubled financial aid uh, over the last decade here, here at Purdue so that particularly needy students are not denied an opportunity to come to our university. I am comforted by two facts in this regard. First, we have more students applying to Purdue than ever in our history. And those numbers have been going up rather regularly. So whatever the tuition is, lots of students want to come. It's clearly not a deterrent to students applying. Uh, and second, when we look at the income distribution of our students, we actually here in West Lafayette have slightly more students at very low income levels than are present in the population of Indiana. And when you look across all of Purdue, West Lafayette and our regional campuses, the income distribution of our students and their families very much mirrors the income distribution of Indiana. Mm -hmm. That tells me uh, that our tuitions are not particularly disadvantaging any uh, income group. We worry a lot about that because uh, back to our basic values, what kind of university we are, we would like to be able to say that every student who's qualified to Purdue to come to Purdue, can come to Purdue no matter their economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. We think that's true. Uh, and we... That data is reflected in what you're so saying. Exactly. Uh, but it's a constant struggle. Uh, and it's something we pay a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. right. And following up, uh, certainly there have been a lot of new hires in the faculty, and I think that the 
scientist has highlighted the work environment and bringing in all the new people on board and I oh. think interdisciplinary research has really taken off here in your presence and the federal part. We tried to put together a strategic plan that would take Purdue to the next level. That's, that was the shorthand for all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ask what makes for a great university, uh, clearly talented students receiving a first-rate education. Um, nothing is more important to that than the quality and number of faculty. So one of our goals was to increase the size of the faculty, to have more faculty in the classroom, full-time faculty teaching our students. And we've been able to add uh, 251 faculty as of the beginning of this academic year. By next fall, we will get to 300, which was our goal. Uh, we have reduced the use of graduate teaching assistants. And we have, because of this increased number of faculty, been able to offer more educational opportunities for students. Study abroad, internships, undergraduate research opportunities, all of which are designed to make this learning environment richer. In addition, because we have these nearly 300 new faculty coming, it will be 300 next fall, we have a growing research capacity. That's the second aspect of our mission, learning, discovery, or research. And there we have both grown the size of the faculty, we have also increased our capacity for interdisciplinary research. That's what Discovery Park is all about. It enables us to tackle more complex, larger scale interdisciplinary research activities. Discovery Park's been a great success. Nearly a thousand of the faculty here at Purdue are engaged in, in one or more of the centers of uh, Discovery Park. That's nearly half of our faculty. Even more students are involved in Discovery Park. And it's given us the opportunity to go after some really big and important issues. Alternative fuels, healthcare delivery, nanotechnology, uh, biomedical engineering. It's been a very, very exciting set of developments. And then thirdly, our third aspect of our mission, what we call engagement, what we used to call extension and outreach, that's also grown in part because of this growth in the size of our faculty and the growth of our research program. Uh, another aspect of land-grant universities that's distinctive is this notion of engagement, that we take our capacities, our research and our educational capacities, our teaching capacities, and put them to work for the citizens of Indiana and beyond. We're out there. We have offices in every county of Indiana. We have special assistance programs, uh, technical assistance programs. We work with a number of hospitals and trying to help them become more efficient, more effective, safer. All of those are aspects of our engagement agenda. Uh, and it has had a special focus in two areas. Economic development. We're trying to help the state of Indiana develop a more robust, more modern uh, economy. And second, in enhancing K-12 education. These are two big challenges for our state in which people want Purdue to be engaged. And we do it happily, willingly. We think it's both part of our mission and it makes us a better university. That's worked extraordinarily. One of the uh, new departments that started is engineering education. That's yeah. when you were here. How did uh, that uh, make any comments on that? Um, this I'm is a thinking for the researchers who are going to be using the yeah. The development of a Department of Engineering Education is another example of Purdue being a national leader, a pioneer. This is the first such mm -hmm. department in the country. Uh, and it's being developed for very, very fundamental and important reasons. First, uh, there's a real concern uh, that our country is not producing enough um, technically trained people, enough engineers. If you look at the trend lines and the number of students enrolling in, graduating from engineering programs in the United States, those numbers are trending down at a time where many other countries of the world, China, India, South Korea, Japan, are trending up. And there's a, a worry that uh, both for economic competitiveness reasons as well as national security reasons, this is not a good direction for our country. So one question, uh, one issue, is how do we increase the numbers of students both prepared for and interested uh, in engineering as a field of study? Uh, one answer to that is to do a better job in uh, grade schools and high schools, both preparing students in terms of the underlying mathematics and science courses, 
but also exposing them to giving them some idea about what engineering is about and we hope inspire and excite their interest uh, and in that way both get more of them enrolled but also help make sure they're better prepared. So that's one impulse to try to expand the number of students uh, studying engineering in the United States. And the second impulse is to increase the number who graduate uh, and in particular to pay attention uh, to the relative underrepresentation of uh, women and minorities uh, in engineering. Um, uh, engineering is a field where a fair number of the students who start out as freshmen in engineering transfer to other fields and we're trying to better understand that uh, from the point of view of why do they leave? Is it their preparation? Uh, did they misunderstand what engineering was before they began studying it? Or does it have something to do with the way we present engineering? Are we presenting it in a way that's interesting to students? Are we presenting it in a way that connects their study of engineering to what they think the practice of engineering is? And finally, do we do it in a way that speaks to some of their broader interests? Uh, this gets back to interdisciplinary issues. Uh, uh, we know, for example, uh, that many of the women who drop out of engineering do so because they don't see the relationship of engineering to how it serves people, uh, how it serves uh, uh, human needs. And uh, I think one of the things we want to do in engineering education is better understand how to teach students in a more inspired way and to try to frankly help them learn engineering uh, more readily. Uh, we think there's a, a lot of knowledge now in educational psychology and learning theories that we can apply in the engineering context to do a better job and thereby increase the retention rates within engineering. More students coming in, more students succeeding, and in some sense, more students getting a better education. That's what leads to this, this starting of the Department of Engineering Education, and uh, it's been amazingly well received nationally. Uh, we've gotten very significant donations to get the program going. We've got a surprising number of very, very talented people applying to the graduate program, quite a number of PhD students, master's students, who I think ultimately themselves want to become engineering educators. Talk a little bit about your visit. You visited all the colleges and the schools around the campus and uh, interacted with the faculty, staff, certainly the library. I was very pleased to. When, when I came to Purdue, um, the charge from the trustees was to, uh, to take Purdue to the next level in a way that made Indiana a better state. Uh, so it meant that uh, we both had to improve the university as an academic institution but connect it, better connect it to Indiana and Indiana's needs. Um, I think one of the ways I do that is to uh, be able to describe to people outside the university what is happening inside the university. Uh, and I spend a lot of time in that kind of communication effort. I typically do 350 to 400 speeches a year. Uh, so it's a major part of my, my activity. Uh, and to do that well, I've got to know what's going on at Purdue. Uh, uh, second, uh, I'm a pretty curious fellow, uh, and I enjoy learning about what faculty and students are doing. Uh, I enjoy hearing about their research. And third, I think one of the ways you, you move a university forward, an entire institution, is to share with people the vision and aspirations we have for the university uh, and to report to them on the progress so that they can see things getting better. Uh, and one of the ways I do this is to visit every one of the colleges and schools of Purdue once a year. Um, uh, I visit every one of the regional campuses. Uh, I have a radio show which allows for call-in, so a lot of communication and uh, my visits to the various colleges here at the West Lafayette campus, I, I always meet with the, lead, with the dean, uh, with the leadership team of the unit. Uh, I meet with students, I always meet with students, uh, and I have an open forum. Uh, and at the open forum, uh, it's about an hour, I take half of it to give a kind of progress report in the university, and then the rest of the time, questions, so that people have a chance to 
ask whatever is on their mind, to offer advice or comments or suggestions. And it's a, a way for me to both communicate what we're trying to do at the university and also to get some feedback and, and to satisfy this curiosity I have so uh, finally I can go out around the state and tell people what's going on in engineering and technology and liberal arts and nursing and all the different disciplines we teach. And uh, uh, as I say, it's part of how I try to carry out my work. I enjoy it. It's very nice, yes. Now, another thing is, we're talking a little bit about athletics. You've been to all the Bulls, and uh, you part just said last night you were at one of the events. Yes. You really participate a lot in both you and your wife do. Uh, at first, I enjoy intercollegiate athletics, the, uh, the athleticism, uh, the grace and beauty of these uh, uh, athletes, and the drama of the competition is uh, pretty exciting. I very much like intercollegiate athletics because it's still amateur athletics and there's a certain uh, purity about it. Uh, and of course these are students, youthful, uh, young people. Uh, I like it a lot and uh, I enjoy uh, watching them. I enjoy cheering for the Boilermakers. Uh, and uh, we often use it as a way of connecting people to the university uh, or working with others, cultivating others, uh, showing interest in others. As I said last night, we were with a group of students from Hillenbrand at the women's basketball game. We always take, uh, invite people to sit with us for the football games on campus. We go to the bowl games. I and mean, we do a lot of those kinds of things. We're uh, big uh, football, basketball, volleyball fans. Uh, uh, we try to do as much of that as we can, although with 20 different sports, it's hard to show up at all the events and still <laughs> carry out the president's responsibilities. Even the individuals can't go to all the sports. Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to make one comment about uh, yeah. Purdue Intercollegiate Athletics. Uh -huh. Very proud of the program. Yes. Um, I think we're in a pretty tough conference, the Big Ten. Uh, I think uh, uh, Purdue's a pretty demanding and challenging university academically. So I, I really admire the student athletes of Purdue in their ability to both be successful athletes and quite good students. Uh, of all the statistics I know about Purdue Intercollegiate Athletics, the one that I am most pleased about is that now for 19 consecutive semesters, nine and a half years, the student athlete's grade point average, averaged across all nearly 500 student athletes, has always been higher than the student body. Uh, and it's been true every semester I have been at Purdue. I think that's an amazing statistic. And it says a lot about the quality of our student athletes as students and athletes. It says a lot about our coaches and the kind of student athletes they recruit. It says a lot about our athletic director, Morgan Burke, and the kind of coaches he brings to Purdue. I think it says something about the values of our university. We want to make sure that there's the proper perspective, if you will, balance in how we think about success in intercollegiate athletics. For us, success means not only success competitively on the field or court, but also success in the classroom. And I think we've done that very well here at Purdue. And many of them have gone on and been recruited to play in the pro. Yeah, but uh, even more graduate. Uh, that, that's the important measure. Uh, our, just like the grade point average, the graduation rate of student athletes is higher than the graduation rate of the student body. That's interesting, yeah. We were talking about students earlier, but you know, international students. You went to that summit, that uh, uh, interna interna international education. What was that, uh, what did you come away from? from this was a summit that was held in Washington a little over a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, hosted by uh, Secretary Spellings, Secretary of Education Margaret Spellings, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Um, uh, and it was uh, a summit in response to the growing concern that many of us had that the, uh, the United States' understandable, indeed necessary, efforts at tightening up immigration in the wake of September 11th, 2001, was beginning to discourage international students from coming to the United States. We and many other universities had witnessed a decline in the number of students applying to study here in the U.S. Um, uh, from other countries of the world 
and fewer students coming to the U.S. to study. Uh, we made those uh, concerns known to the president, the vice president, uh, uh, members of his cabinet, uh, members of the Congress. I testified to Senator Luger when he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about this. And this summit was uh, to respond to that concern and to express on behalf of the country, uh, as the president put it, that uh, we welcome students from around the world to our, our universities. Uh, we think this is an important part of, of creating a rich educational environment. And uh, we wanted to know, these students to know that they were welcome here uh, in the United States. It was also uh, an opportunity for uh, the President, the Secretary of State, to emphasize uh, the importance of teaching uh, foreign languages, uh, uh, particularly critical foreign languages that, frankly, we had relatively few students studying. Uh, languages like Pashtun, which is a major language of, uh, uh, of Afghanistan, uh, Arabic, uh, other languages that uh, we didn't have very many people studying, uh, but languages that are absolutely vitally important to our national security, very, very important to our global trade. Uh, so it was also a, a, a time where the President and the Secretary of State announced a major new initiative to enhance the study of foreign languages and so-called area studies where people study other areas of, of the world. A great occasion. There were about 100 university presidents there. I was among them. In addition to the president, uh, Secretary Spelling, Secretary Rice, uh, we had uh, Mr. Negropani, who is the direct, director of national intelligence. Uh, uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, was there. The First Lady spoke. Uh, uh, the new Assistant Secretary for Public Diplomacy, uh, uh, Karen Hughes, a close associate of the president. So it was a pretty spectacular display of uh, the president's uh, leadership team. And I think it added all the more emphasis to how important they thought it was to sort of set the record straight that we really did want international students coming to the United States. Uh, but they had to recognize that these, uh, this more careful attention to uh, immigration visas, uh, was an understandable and necessary thing given the, uh, the war on terror. Yeah, agree, agree. You, you mentioned engagement, and I think that a couple of things that I read, the students have also been very much engaged, and they always yeah. have been, like they're collecting the money for the Kasami, and so they have really, yeah. really picked up on that. So uh, our students are uh, overwhelmingly a very generous and uh, caring group. Um, uh, be it the tsunami, uh, the hurricanes, 9/11, uh, they did. Yeah, 9/11. Uh, uh, they they uh, they care a lot about each other and the community and their fellow citizens. We've tried to encourage that kind of generous spirit, that sense of giving and volunteering and sharing, and to do it in a way that enhances the learning of our students. So. We have focused a lot of attention on what we call student service learning, mm -hmm. uh, service activities that enhance the learning of our students, not only of their disciplines, but some broader ideas about citizenship, about generosity, about volunteerism. Um, and our students have responded spectacularly. Uh, we now have a, a special fund every year uh, in the Office of the Vice Provost for Engagement where students can apply for grants, uh, up to $500 for an individual student, up to $1,500 for a group. And we have uh, hundreds of applications every year, students working with uh, social service agencies, uh, uh, children with disabilities, uh, senior citizens. Uh, we had students to go down to Mississippi uh, for the, in the aftermath of the hurricanes. Uh, all kinds of shoveling sidewalks for the elderly, all kinds of activities uh, that allow our students to uh, both express this generous spirit they have and to learn from it. Uh, uh, I think we have become, as a university, a better citizen of this larger community uh, because of that increased emphasis on 
student service learning. It's had a big impact on our students, and I would also tell you it's had a big impact on our faculty and staff, and it's begun to change the curriculum. We probably have hundreds of courses now that include a service learning component to them. So the students not only learn in the classroom and from their textbooks, but in some sense learn from their experiences that are part of the courses. When you're talking about students and everybody's got traditions and uh, through us many of them. How about the new one that we've got, the railroad tracks? That's kind of interesting. Crossing the tracks. Crossing uh, the tracks. Well, this is, uh, this is the home of the Boilermakers, okay. and of course uh, that has its origins in the railroad uh, sure. t uh, railroads of uh, the United States. And uh, it's a way of reinforcing the sense of belonging, the sense of being part of this community. Uh, when freshmen come to us, we... Uh, we uh, encourage them to participate in our orientation program, Boiler Gold Rush, which is a wonderful program and very exciting. It's, uh, I, I speak to the new freshmen every year, and it's the one time of the year I, I think I have some sense of how rock stars feel because uh, these freshmen, they're, they're, they haven't started classes. It's a week before class. Right. They are so excited and so energized and pumped, as they like to say, uh, that uh, I've, I've actually thought I could read the phone book to them and they'd cheer. Uh, they were, they're just so, so uh, uh, pleased to be here. Uh, part of becoming a Boilermaker is uh, getting wet in the fountains. And now a new part of uh, being a Boilermaker is crossing the tracks, uh, if you will, coming from the outside into our family by crossing over these nice tracks. Tradition. It is. And... Uh, Thanks to the Rusts, uh, we have this new tradition started this last year, and I'm sure it'll be part of uh, the many traditions uh, of Purdue. Oh, that go along with them. Now, you mentioned a little bit earlier, but I want to do a few comments on your community visits. You have really, as you said earlier, visited most of all, many of the cities, and now you're doing it again and also asking for some input on the next strategic plan. What, how does, uh, are you going to try to cover as many as you can before you? Yes. It's back to this bigger picture of communicating what's happening at Purdue and also uh, listening to those we seek to serve. Uh, this is a public university. Uh, uh, Purdue exists for very important public purposes. And one of the ways you ensure that you serve those public purposes is to ask that public, what would they like from Purdue? So I've been, uh, all the time I've been at Purdue, doing community visits. We probably have done 70 to 80 of them where I spend a whole day in a community. I typically visit some businesses. I'll visit a high school or a grade school, a middle school. I'll typically have a luncheon engagement with a civic group, a chamber of commerce or rotary, uh, visit farms, uh, visit uh, social agencies, hospitals, and then in the evening, I typically have some kind of alumni or fundraising kind of activity related to alums of uh, Purdue. Uh, yesterday, before I went to the basketball game with the students from Hillenbrand, I was in uh, Johnson County uh, and at Greenwood uh, visiting uh, that community. I uh, started out at a company started by one of our alums, Grimmer Schmidt. They make compressors. I went to the high school where I learned about service learning activities in the Greenwood High School at the high school level. Uh, then met with a group of community leaders, uh, mayors, uh, county commissioners, business leaders, talked about Purdue and what we had done and asked for their input and advice on what we might do next, uh, what should the next strategic plan focus on. Uh, after that meeting, I uh, visited a dairy farm, uh, uh, the Kelsey Farm, and then uh, visited a company that makes uh, bearings, Nachi, uh, makes bearings for the automotive industry, and ended up with a reception for alums. Uh, a typical kind of visit uh, designed fundamentally to give me an opportunity to share with the citizens of Indiana what we are doing at Purdue, hopefully to instill more pride in them and to let them know that the very precious tax dollars that they give to us through our legislature and the governor are being wisely spent uh, and to let them know how we can be of help to them as citizens, as business leaders, as community leaders. And then second, to
to learn from them what the needs of those individuals, communities, and businesses are so we can be more effective in serving them. And that's a two and you've been very active also in the local community too. From oh, exactly. I think it's an, it, we're, we're a public university. Uh, uh, the citizens of Indiana are in some real sense the shareholders of Purdue. And I just think it's very wise uh, to stay in touch with those people. And uh, uh, overwhelmingly, they are proud of Purdue. Overwhelmingly, they are grateful for what we're accomplishing. They often have good advice. I mean, uh, their comments are almost always positive, reinforcing. And I've gotten a lot of great ideas out of these visits. And I'm also curious, so I enjoy it. I mean, I get a chance to learn and, uh, about new things and uh, meet new people. Uh, it's a fun part of my job. That's kind of it's a challenge, and they welcome the opportunity. Oh, yeah, they love it. Yeah. Uh, many of these communities uh, are quite honored that the president of their land-grant university would take time out to spend a day with them. So it's a big event for uh, a, a number of these communities, and it's a big event for me. As I say, I, I really enjoy it. Uh, 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 every visit I have made, I have learned something. Every visit I have made, I have come back feeling better about Purdue. Uh, and every visit I have made has... I want to jump ahead a little bit, and you noticed on the topics that I have submitted that some of the things for the research, uh, share some thoughts on some of the, uh, and I have a couple of items, so if you we might want to talk a little bit about that, if that's okay. Sure. Some was on the fundraising, and uh, I'll just go down, but people that will be studying, you know, using the, the, the transcript, and, pres and so to share some thoughts is what I was asking. Um, <clears throat> when we came to Purdue, um, as I said, the charge was to take Purdue to the next level in a way that makes Indiana a better state. Uh, it was unmistakably clear to me it would take more money. It would take more financial resources. Uh, second, it was also clear to me that there was a huge opportunity in fundraising here at Purdue. We have nearly 400,000 alumni, um, uh, some enormously successful people. Overwhelmingly, the alums of Purdue love this university and are grateful to it. Um, and I thought there was a terrific opportunity to expand fundraising. And I didn't see how to accomplish all of the things we wanted to accomplish without the additional resources that could come from fundraising. So I knew actually before I started that we were going to have a capital campaign. Uh, and I immediately uh, set to work in trying to make sure we had the capacity to raise considerably more money. And we spent some time reviewing the fundraising organization. Uh, we recruited leadership for that uh, in the person of Murray Blackwelder, the senior vice president for advancement. Uh, we developed the strategic plan in part uh, with a mind toward it being a part of our fundraising effort. That is, you, you've got to have things for which you are fundraising, uh, projects, ideas, and we wanted to make sure that the people who were going to be solicited for funds um, understood how their donations were going to contribute to this larger effort at Purdue uh, to make Purdue a better university to take it to the next level. Um, we kicked off the campaign uh, at a billion three. Um, frankly, the consultants we had brought in uh, we're not optimistic about how much money we could raise and uh, we took a pretty big leap of faith that we could raise that kind of money. In, in part, we thought we could, we hoped we could. In part, we needed that kind of fundraising to carry out all of the elements of the strategic plan. Um, and it just went fabulously well. Um, the Lilly Endowment was key, I think by the end of this campaign, they'll have contributed nearly a hundred million dollars to Purdue. We had some alums like Bill Binley and Mike Burke step forward with record-setting gifts. Uh, Mike and Kay Burke gave us 30 million dollars. It paid for half the nanotechnology center, largest gift in the history of the university for a, for a facility. Bill Binley 
committed $52.5 million in cash and deferred uh, gifts, the largest gift ever from an individual. Um, I think of the 20 largest gifts in the history of the university, 17 or 18 have been in this campaign. So uh, the alums of Purdue have stepped forward uh, uh, in amazing ways. Foundations like the Lilly Endowment, corporations, uh, Caterpillar, IBM, Boeing, Intel, I mean, just go down the list, uh, very generous. Um, nearly 200,000 different donors have contributed to our campaign. And the faculty, staff, and retirees of Purdue have been amazingly generous. Uh, our initial goal, uh, we thought was pretty ambitious, to raise $40 million from among the faculty, staff, and retirees. We blew through that and set a second goal of $50 million. And as we speak, we've raised over $55 million from the faculty, staff, and retirees of Purdue. I mean, the people that know us best who work here are really reaching deep into their pockets uh, to help Purdue. It's a sign of their love and affection. It's a sign of their confidence. We've also raised $55 million from the greater Lafayette community. Just think of that, $110 million from either the employees, former employees of Purdue, or the community members. It's absolutely astonishing. And uh, we raised the goal after uh, a few years of the public phase in 2004. We raised it to a billion five. And as we speak, uh, we have reached that goal. Uh, we have, uh, in fact, it was December 26th, the day after Christmas, uh, we reached $1.5 billion. And we're continuing to work. We still have more projects that we want to finish, particularly five facility projects we're hard at work on. But it's been an amazing thing. Uh, and I, as I reflect back on why have we had all of this success, I think there are lots of reasons, but I want to focus on a few important ones. Uh, first, Purdue has been a great university for a long time. And there are lots of people, lots of organizations that are both grateful to Purdue for what it has done and really, really want to help Purdue continue to grow and do more. Uh, so they're both expressing their gratitude, but also investing in the future. Uh, second, I think it's an enormous vote of confidence in the trustees and the leadership of the university and our faculty and staff. I mean, this is a pretty massive investment. And I think people don't make those kinds of investments unless they have a lot of confidence that the money will be used wisely and it will accomplish its intended purposes. Third, uh, we've got a fabulous group of people here at Purdue today, uh, uh, professional fundraisers, uh, administrators, deans, provosts, vice presidents, faculty who have created this great team. Um, and we have worked very hard on this. Uh, there's an element of time on task when it comes to fundraising. And we have devoted the effort to it. Uh, we have been pretty sophisticated about our fundraising. We use pretty modern information techniques to find our donors. Uh, we work hard to prepare interesting proposals. Uh, we try to put on events that inspire people. Uh, I think we've become very good at this. And then the most important thing we've delivered. Uh, people have given us these resources and we attract better students. People have given us these resources and we have recruited talented faculty. People give us these resources and we build a nanotechnology building, a bioscience building. And, I mean, we have actually uh, shown results and all of that together has made this enormously successful. It makes me, frankly, pretty confident about Purdue and its future. I will say that it is my view that this kind of fundraising must be an integral part of the university going forward. Uh, our ambitions are very, very high. Uh, we really do want to be one of the preeminent universities of the world. And to do that, it's going to continue to take significant resources. And one element uh, of our plans to gain those resources is continued emphasis on private philanthropy. What about um, management steward stewardship of a large research university, the challenges that that presents? Well, they, they don't call our trustees trustees for uh, without good reason. Uh, this university is held in trust. 
uh, by the trustees on behalf of the people of Indiana. And uh, every trust or every trustee has a fiduciary responsibility for, to those for whom the trust is held. Uh, those of us who work at the university share in that mm -hmm. trust. And uh, among our responsibilities is to assure that uh, Purdue will be able to continue to carry out its work at a very high level, that we will hand over the university to the next generation, the next set of leaders, we hope in better condition than we received it, and they in turn will do that to the next set, that this is always about getting better, always building a brick higher, if you will. That's part of the culture of Purdue that makes it such a great university. Um, there are challenges. Uh, uh, the world of uh, higher education, more broadly, the knowledge of the world, how we develop new insights, new ideas, new knowledge, changes. It's intensely competitive. Uh, we've got a huge physical plant here that we try to keep in good repair and safe condition. Uh, all of that takes resources. It's not easy to do, uh, certainly, but it's important and uh, absolutely at the heart of these responsibilities that first the trustees have formally, legally, but I think all of us share. Uh, uh, Purdue is now in its 100 and 37th year, 138th year rather, uh, of existence and um, it's always gotten better and I don't think any of us want to uh, be, be the first generation that loses that, uh, that upward trajectory. I, I think, I feel, uh, I believe uh, that we have, uh, we have done that in, uh, in certainly in the time I've been at Purdue. I feel very good about uh, the progress that we have made as a university. Uh, it's very much a team effort. Lots of people have contributed, but I think by all the sensible measures you would use to judge whether the university is a better institution today. Who studies here, what they learn, who teaches here, what they discover, uh, how we serve the larger societal purposes we are uh, charged with. Uh, I think by all those kinds of measures, Purdue is a better university, and it certainly feels like a better university. There's more energy, more excitement, more optimism, and more confidence. Um, so I think we have done our, our job in our time, and uh, I think we are um, handing over the leadership of Purdue to a new president uh, at a time when uh, Purdue is a great place to be at. Uh, I think this is a, a splendid presidency, a splendid university, and every reason to be very, very optimistic about the future. Do you have a favorite? Um, we have about three minutes left. Okay, thanks. Do you have a, a favorite or uh, outstanding event that you'd like to share with us, or a favorite memory, or anything like that? I have so many then, good memories. Jeske, I ask that to people, and they have to stop and think of it. You know? yeah, um, okay. I hardly ever have a bad day. Um, uh, almost all the things I do at Purdue, I enjoy doing. Uh, so I have lots of great memories. Every commencement is a joy. Uh, every boiler gold rush is a, a great rush for the president. Um, uh, we've had some spectacular announcements, the kickoff of the campaign, uh, announcing the Burke gift, the Binley gift. Those were exciting. And then there's been literally thousands of precious moments when a faculty member shares a new discovery or a, a student uh, says how grateful they are for the education they have received or someone writes back and says, way to go. I mean, it, it, it's, it's made uh, this whole time very, very rewarding. And so there's no singular event. There's no moment where all of a sudden I said, gee, this is a pretty good job. It's always been like that. A cluster is better, and it pulls it all together. Yeah, and it's consistent, and it, um, and and I believe uh, uh, I'm not the only one that feels that way. I think for many of us at Purdue, I think vast majority of us, this is a happy place to be and a happy time to be here. Uh, it's not to say it's easy 
or we don't have our challenges, and there are occasional moments where uh, it gets uh, downright tough and difficult, but overwhelmingly, this has been a good time. And a ha as I say, a happy, and maybe a better word is a, an enormously rewarding time. I mean, for me, being president of Purdue has been this amazing combination of challenging. I've had to work hard and use all the talents I have had. Interesting. I've met amazing people. I've tackled interesting problems. Enormously rewarding. Uh, I feel very good about having served as president and ultimately important. And I like to tell students, if you can get that combination of challenging, interesting, rewarding, and important, you will lead a rich and full life. And I feel that way about my time here at Purdue. For Patty and me, this has been the highlight of our professional work, and uh, I just feel very, very good about it. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Gessie, for sharing this. We really appreciate that, and I thank you so much. Thank you. And the interview. Thank you.